Okay, so we will now uh, resume the high-level event of the General Assembly on the contributions of North-South, South-South Triangular Cooperation in ICT for Development to the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. I would like, first of all, to welcome uh, all of you to our second panel of the high-level event on the contributions of North-South, South-South, and Triangular Cooperation and ICT for development implementation of the 2050 development agenda. As we all know, Millennium Development Goals have been a fabulous instrument to focus the attention of the international community on poverty reduction. Three out of the eight Millennium Development Targets on poverty, slum, water have been met ahead of the 2015 deadline. But the financial crisis that exploded in 2008 has significantly slowed down the progress on other targets. North-South, South-South, and Triangular Corporation were greatly affected by the financial downturn. The crisis had large spillovers in the developing world. In a resolution of the 65th General Assembly of the UN, dedicated to the follow-up of the outcome of the Millennium Summit, it is clearly stated that, and I quote, the financial and economic crisis has reversed development gains in many developing countries and threatens to seriously undermine the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, end of quote. Since then, the world's economy has experienced a very fragile but continuous recovery, so we are now in a good place to start thinking not only about how to augment cooperation and how to make it more efficient, this is where ICT can play a pivotal role in ensuring the post-2015 development goals fulfillment. New technologies of communication completely changed the way we work, move, and relate to each other. From the microprocessor in 1946 to Facebook 2007, satellite communications, mobile devices, cloud computing, art artificial intelligence, all have transformed our habits, made the world smaller, and promoted dialogue among cultures. However, the truth remains that the digital, the digital gap between developed and developing countries and between urban and rural areas could represent a big challenge to equality among world population. So it is important at this point to ensure that education and technology transfer can help to assure that ICTs don't become another element contributing to inequality. Today, we seek to explore how the different types of international cooperation can serve to enhance the means of implementation of the post-2015 agenda. The areas of cooperation should include trade, human resource building, technology transfer, financing for sustainable development, among others. We'll also try to identify the existing national and international mechanisms that can elevate the effectiveness of official development assistance and make it more human-oriented, aiming to lift people from extreme poverty, improving education, or food security. Cooperation shall work hand-in-hand -hand with the latest developments in technology to ensure the reduction of the technology gap, overall access to internet and other telecommunication services in least developed countries, and reduce inequality. To help us find some possible solutions and determine the outline of how cooperation and ICTs shall interact with the post-2015 agenda, we have gathered today a group of distinguished panelists and discussants. We will first hear from our prominent panelists, each of which will have five minutes to present their dissertations. Our panel this afternoon is composed first by His Excellency Dr. Hamadoun Touré, Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union where he has collaborated for an extended period and where he also served as director of the Telecommunications Development Bureau. Dr. Touré also co-chairs the Broadband Commission for Digital Development, has promoted events as important as Connect Africa, and is a firm believer in the importance of government, industry, and academia working together to maximize the opportunities that ICTs can offer. Her Excellency, Mrs. Suvi Linden, after serving as Minister of Communications and a Member of Parliament for Finland, 
was appointed ITU Special Envoy to the Broadband Commission uh, for Digital Development. She has occupied uh, positions in a number of international organizations and was named Visionary of the Year by the Intelligence Community Forum. Thirdly, we have uh, Dr. David Stephen, who is a senior fellow and associate director at the Center on International Cooperation at NYU. Dr. Stevens has advised the UNDP and a number of member states and the president of the General Assembly on how to address the post-2015 agenda. He also works on global risks, foreign policy, and international development. Today, we're also honored by the presence of three well-informed and eager discussions from different backgrounds who will hopefully spice up our dialogue. That is Mrs. Anita Gudemurthy, Executive Director of IT for Change, uh, Mrs. Corrine Woods, Director of the UN uh, Millennium Campaign, and Mr. Matthew Bombs, Communications Manager of Communitas, Coalition for Sustainable Cities and Regions in the New UN Development Agenda. Each of them will be allocated uh, three minutes to express their insights with respect to the panelists' expositions. We will also open the floor after each discussion presentation to engage the public in our debate. So let's begin with Dr. Ture. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and good afternoon to you all. Before I start my speech, I, we have a, I have a two-minute video that I would like you to, uh, to share with you. Please uh, put the video on, please. Thank you. Uh, I like to start my speeches with a small video because when I was a kid, I used to always sleep before the end of a movie. And when I, uh, I, and I come out of it, I say, oh, it was a great movie, you know, why I haven't seen anything. So I hope you didn't sleep here. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the 21st century, ICTs are everywhere, all around us. And they affect almost everything we do or even even things we aspire to do. This is not mere rhetoric, rhetoric, this is a fact. ICTs are an essential feature of modern life, whether you want to deliver clean water to your people or power supplies to a city or education to kids or universal healthcare. 
across the population. They are essential to getting a job, to uh, creating a job, or keeping a job. They are essential to providing good governance and good government and good public services. They are essential in reducing poverty. In fact, they are essential in creating wealth, achieving gender equality, and ensuring the inclusion in our society of minority and marginalized groups. They are essential in preserving our environment and in preserving our rich cultural diversity. And they are essential in driving entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, and economic growth. We all recognize this. Indeed, as Ban Ki-moon said just last week on the occasion of the World Telecommunication and Information Society Day, May 17th, he said, broadband connectivity is a transform transformative tool to achieve the three pillars of sustainable development, economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental balance. It is a key element of the debate on the post-2015 development agenda. In the past 10 years, we have brought virtually all of humanity within reach of mobile cellular communications, and we have come close to fulfilling our dream in connecting the world. According to the latest forecast from ITU, released just two weeks ago, there will be almost as many mobile cellular subscriptions worldwide as there are people by the end of this year, and there will be close to 3 billion people online connected to the internet. This is truly fantastic, but we still have far to go because by the end of 2014, more than half of the world people and two thirds of people in the developing world are still offline. And they still uh, will still be without access to the most important tool we have ever seen in terms of improving global development, in terms of health education, poverty reduction, and much more. We all recognize this. It was recognized by the least developed countries, the LDCs with the LDC4 uh, conference in Istanbul in 2011, calling for 100% access to the internet by 2020, and recognizing ICT networks as basic infrastructure equal to water, transportation, and energy. It was recognized by the Global Youth Summit, which was held in Costa Rica last September, under the theme Beyond 2015. The Beyond 2015 Declaration, which also calls for universal access to the internet, was taken by President Laura Chinchilla of Costa Rica to the UN General Assembly last year. It was recognized by the Broadband Commission for Digital Development, which was set up by ITU and UNESCO in 2010 to help accelerate progress toward meeting the Millennium Development Goals and to call for making, uh, for, for making broadband policy universal by 2015. Uh, our, one of our speakers, uh, Suvi Linden, is a member of the, that broadband commission. Uh, at our most recent meeting in March in Dublin, we saw commissioner after commissioner take the floor to stress the importance of ICTs and especially broadband in ensuring sustainable development as we move forward and the need to have this formally recognized in the post-2015 development process. It was recognized by the World Telecommunication Development Conference, WTDC 14, which recently reaffirmed the global commitment to ICTs as an enabler for sustainable development. It was recognized at the 11th session of the Open Working Group, the OWG, which took place at the beginning of this month, where many participants pointed out how ICTs are key enablers across nearly all of the focus areas identified uh, uh, to date. I mean, I'm speaking, I know that yesterday, uh, and the Secretary General and Helen Clark, the Administrator of UNDP, both spoke the same thing. We all recognize this. So why, with more than four billion people still offline, are ICTs not playing a more central and more explicit role in the definition of the post-2015 development process? Distinguished delegates, the ICT revolution was not given the priority it deserved in the MDG era, and we cannot afford to make the same mistake this time around. In the 21st century and in shaping the post-2015 development agenda, we simply cannot ignore the vital role that ICTs play and will continue to play in improving the lives of every single person on the planet. 
ICTs must therefore be given greater prominence in the UN post-2015 development agenda as catalysts for broad economic and social development and as keystones in the process. And yet, we can see that this is not yet happening and that ICTs have not yet gained the full attention that they deserve. Let me therefore make a clear, strong and passionate uh, request to all delegates and to all member states participating in the open working group to bring this matter to the top of the agenda as a cross-cutting enabler and as a goal or target as appropriate and in so doing help to make the world a better place for all. Let's make sure that the existing target from LDC4 and the call to make broadband universal have a solid place in the post-2015 development agenda. This is not about language and terminology. This is about human progress in the 21st century. We all recognize this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ture, for your uh, presentation. Now uh, we'll hear uh, from Her Excellency Suvi Linden, former Minister of Communications of Finland and member of the Broadband Commission for Digital Development. You have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, technology is transforming every corner of life and is creating new global order. It took about 75 years for telephone to connect 50 million people. Today, a simple mobile app or game can reach that milestone in a day. In the past decade, the rate of adoption of new technologies has accelerated at a dizzying speed. I would like to concentrate on how to access to internet to be, can be made affordable for everyone. When I was a Minister of Communications of Finland, government decided to make an access to internet with one megabit per second as a legal right. That was not easy, needed hours and hours public-private negotiations, rough language, but finally we made it. That was considered revolutionary at that time. However, one size does not fit all and Finnish model is not necessarily the right one for other countries. Therefore, it is important to share experiences and I strongly feel that all governments should find their own way to provide affordable access to everyone. The wheel need not to be invented over and over. The best practices and their implementation should be studied first. It is important that we share information and use it where applicable. Today's mobile services need spectrum, and the use of spectrum is regulated by governments. What is unique in spectrum is that every country has it, whether the country is poor or rich. New generation technologies and networks provide every day better and better possibilities to reach out for everyone. Also, a great thing is that the private sector is willing to do the investments and provide accessibility. There are sparsely populated rural areas where it is a challenge, but with good public-private cooperation, it can be done. But there is a condition for that. Private sector needs enabling environment to invest in networks and to operate them. My first conclusion, we should share more information how to do things well, and that really is a key for the post-2015 development agenda. We have so much experience in different parts of the world, what we can use also in other parts of the world without harming any country's national interest or business environment. We also have a lot of information in international organizations and institutions, and we should share it more efficiently than what we are doing at this moment. Broadband Commission has found out that the leadership and understanding for ICT's empowerment is needed because it is very tempting to kill the milking cow by too heavy taxation and too high level prices for spectrum allocation. It is clear that balanced business models can be created to offer affordable access if the policy environment and regula regulatory framework is not clear and stable. Understanding of ICT's great benefits for the country, governments should consider telecommunication infrastructure as an investment for sustain sustainable development of the country. 
And also latest ICT statistics show that some developing and emerging countries are moving forward quite rapidly and we have clear evidence and improved networks have resulted to GPD growth and boost up of economy. My second conclusion, leadership is needed and public-private partnerships in ICTs are necessary in building sustainable development for any country. It is vital to create a stable regulatory and political framework for local and international business sector. Healthy and responsible private sector is a cornerstone. I would like to share with you some thoughts on empowerment. A good empowerment activity is, for example, that those African countries which have found the right track in building digital society should provide their experience and best practices for those countries who are still struggling and lacking behind. As we are demanding to have ICT embedded to all fields of post-2015 agenda, I would also strong, strongly urge donor governments to review their strategies for international development. Is ICT embedded there? To provide capacity building, creating a broadband plan is, is needed. In a plan should be defined how the ICT infrastructure will be created and also how it will be utilized. And understanding of information security is utmost important and should, be, should play a big role in the plan. Our commission has set broadband plan one of, the, one of our five targets and still over 60 countries do not have it. Taking the civil society part of the planning and have them also true owners of the process is important. We need more engaging partnership in society. We should create empowering environment for local innovations. People know best their needs in local level. It is amazing how innovative people can be when they are given tools and possibility to use their creativity. Social media is a good example of a platform where good achievements are praised and those not so successful criticized. It can be used to invoke thoughts, exchange ideas and create new innovator, innovations never seen before. One key issue is of course the basic education and it is foundation to any development and is perhaps the most important tool for empowerment. With modern ICT technology we could do miracles in development programs and education. Women should have the same rights to be engaged in the digital world. Unfortunately, there is a wide gap between men's and women's possibilities to enjoy the benefits of mobilized world. It should be clear for, all, for us all that little girls need as much education for their future as boys. My third conclusion, it is all about empowerment and education for all. ICTs create unforeseen possibilities to cooperate and share information. We should use these possibilities wisely. The most practical innovations are created at local level to meet practical needs. Well, thank you, Your Excellency, for your insights and uh, thought-provoking ideas. And now we move over to Dr. David Stephen, Senior Fellow and Associate Director at the Center for International Cooperation at New York University. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been asked to focus my remarks on the contribution of North-South, South-South and triangular cooperation to the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. I'll mention at ICT only in passing, as this has been covered very effectively by the other panelists in their interesting presentations. I'd like to start by taking a step back in order to reflect on the scale of the task ahead of us. Before we can talk about how we are going to implement a new development agenda, we need to understand in broad terms at least what we have to implement. Thanks to a number of valuable contributions to the post-2015 debate, we are now beginning to gain an idea of what the priorities between 20 and 2015 and 2030 are likely to be. In particular, the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals has given us a number of draft goals and targets. Now, of course, I should emphasize none of these are yet agreed, but they give, give us a sense of the size of the implementation task that lies ahead of us. 
I think it's very important that we're under no illusions. The post-2015 agenda will be tens, if not hundreds of times more ambitious than the one set out in the Millennium Declaration and through the Millennium Development Goals. Let me illustrate this through three components of the emerging agenda. The first proposed goal from the Open Working Group is, is end extreme poverty el everywhere. And the first proposed target under that goal is eradicate extreme poverty by 2030. There is, I think, universal agreement that ending extreme poverty is an overriding global priority, but it's going to be much harder to end poverty than it was to halve it as part of the MDGs. As we reduce the number of people living in extreme poverty, those that are left are, will increasingly come from the most disadvantaged groups and the most marginalized communities, and a growing proportion will live in countries where conflict or the legacy of conflict has stopped or reversed development. Getting to zero on this goal, taking all people out of absolute poverty, regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, religion, disability, etc., it's a huge task and one that can only be accomplished through extremely effective and targeted action that puts marginalized people first. The same is true when we look at education. In 2015, we now know that we're going to fail to deliver the MDG goal to achieve universal primary education with 50 million or so children currently out of school. As part of the post-2015 agenda, we will not seek to just put these children, make sure these children go to school every day. We will also try to ensure that they learn properly when they are there. At the moment, approximately 250 million children fail to gain basic literacy or numeracy skills, and many more receive an education that is far from preparing them for the demands of the modern labor market. Building schools is easy. Getting all children to learn, including the poorest and most disadvantaged, will be much, much harder. Our post-2015 education aspirations are easy to talk about. They need transform transformational change if they are to be delivered. Finally, let me turn briefly to the challenge of energy. There is talk of targets to provide 100% access to modern energy by 2030, while doubling renewable energy and the pace of improvement in energy efficiency. This is an effort that requires a double or doubling or tripling of capital investment in the energy sector, maybe as much as another $800 billion of investment each year, and extremely effective action to direct that investment towards the parts of the world that need it most. At the same time, we will require unprecedented advances in policy and rapid behavioral change if we are to build sustainable energy systems. Again, another massive task. I can make the same argument about every focus area under consideration by the Open Working Group. In each case, there is a huge gulf between business as usual trends, where we might expect to get to, to by 2030 if we do nothing, and the goals and targets we are likely to set for that date. This then defines the implementation challenge, and I propose viewing that challenge through five well-established principles of development partnership, ownership, alignment, harmonization, results, and mutual accountability. Let's start with ownership, alignment, and harmonization. These principles will look very different under the new set of goals, goals that will be universally applicable to all countries while taking into account their national realities. National planning and domestic re resource mobilization must clearly be at the heart of the new agenda, but that requires work to start now the most far-sighted countries are already beginning to work on policies, strategies, and plans in order to be straight out of the blocks on implementing the new agenda. And it's not just national governments. Just yesterday, I heard of a provincial government that is starting to rethink its education system and its plans for that system for the post-2015 environment. We need more, many more to join these pathfinders with every country, rich and poor, taking responsibility for how it plans to implement the new agenda at home. Whether we're talking about North-South, South-South, or triangular cooperation, implementation will only be effective if there is genuine national ownership and effective alignment with national strategies, institutions, and procedures. Harmonization, meanwhile, will not simply be a job for a few donors, but the much greater endeavor of building effective multi-country and multi-sector partnerships that have the common purpose, knowledge, and financing to deliver transformational change. At the same time, we will need to make a new commitment to managing for results. 
The first step is a significant improvement in the nature and effectiveness of North-South cooperation. In part, this requires countries from the North to do more to work with partners from the South to create the conditions that make sustainable development possible. This is what is often known as the Beyond Aid Agenda. But I would strongly disagree with those who play down the importance of official development assistance within the post-2015 agenda. Yes, it is true that aid is now dwarfed by other financial flows, but it is often the only additional finance that is available for investing in the prospects of the poorest and most mar marginalized people. It can also be directed at new and emerging challenges and at reform, given that other public resources are often already allocated to recurrent expenditure. It also plays an important role in leveraging other sources of finance, private, philanthropic, innovative, etc., and can attract a significant, significant multiplier if carefully deployed. South-South cooperation also involves important financial flows and will undoubtedly play an increasingly powerful role after 2015, but it brings something even more important than finance, a focus on solutions and effective models that have worked in one country and can be applied to others with appropriate adjustments to a new national context. It is this flow of ideas and knowledge that we need to focus on and accelerate if the ambitions of the post-2015 development agenda are to be delivered we need to create laboratories of sustainable development. For me too, this is where technology comes into play. In the future, we'll, we'll have a much greater ability to transfer resources directly to poor people and poor families using modern technologies. We will be able to invest in a new generation of institutions and partnership structures that could not have been supported by the technologies of the 20th century and we will be able to harness markets in ways that make sustainable development possible. Let me close by emphasizing the importance of mutual accountability when we consider the contribution that North-South, South-South, and triangular cooperation can make to the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. Account accountability starts today. It starts with our willingness to develop realistic plans to implement all parts of the agenda along with baselines and monitoring mechanisms to allow us to see whether we are on track to achieve targets in 2017, in 2023, and 2027. Here are two numbers, 589 and 5,475. We have just 589 days before the implementation of the post-2015 agenda must start. There is an immense amount of planning and preparatory work to do if we're to hit the ground running on the 1st of January 2016. And 95% of that work is in areas where there are extremely high levels of consensus among member states about what needs to be done, about what needs to be done, but less consensus about how we can achieve it. Then from the beginning of 2016 to the end of 2030, we have just 5,475 days in which to, develop a new, to deliver a new set of goals and targets. With so much to do, we cannot afford to lose any of that time. We must bring together all forms of cooperation, north-south, south-south, and triangular, into a new form of global cooperation that can collectively deliver the vision for the future we want that member states developed at Rio Plus 20. I'd like to thank you for your time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Stephen, for your remarks, and now, uh We'll hear presentations by the discussants, and thereafter the floor will be opened uh, for comments, observations, and questions. So we'll begin with our first discussant. Uh, it is the founding member and executive director of IT for Change, Mrs. Anita Gurumurthy. Thank you, respected chair and distinguished delegates. In the globalized, techno-mediated context, ICTs are not merely tools, but a foundational logic underpinning social interaction. The technical architecture of the internet, and more generally, the digital phenomenon, constructs our social interactions at all levels, economic, social, political, and cultural. For instance, the internet recasts the public participation of women and other marginalized groups bringing hitherto unimagined opportunities for their voice and agency, but equally posing new questions for their privacy and security. 
These issues by no means are merely technical, but eminently social and developmental. Today, private interests are getting embedded into the very DNA of the digital ecosystem. The structure and ownership of social data is controlled by corporate interests. Public agencies with fiduciary responsibilities to hold public data under national legal frameworks are fading into the background, often engaging corporations to make sense of such data for public policy. The specter is rather chilling. The possibility of new applications using what is essentially public data are infinite, but the absence of policy and legal frameworks to protect civic rights starkly absent. The idea of big data for development is often deployed glibly. But while big data pervasively collects all manner of private information, the operations of big data itself are almost entirely shrouded in legal and commercial secrecy. Big data evidence technicalizes issues that are basically social. The rhetoric of big data privileges large government and corporate entities at the expense of ordinary individuals by eliminating from the radar of decision making the thick issues of power and contestation invisible on the data scape. In reality, representativeness of real-time digital data is highly questionable. Inputs ignore large sections of the population who do not participate online and who lack resources, typically the majority of the world's women. In this changing data scape, it is obvious that the claim to truth is increasingly becoming proprietary. Today, in the name of inclusion, financial institutions deploy reverse redlining using metadata purchased from data brokers to split the real estate market into sophisticated micro-populations that are given labels such as rural and barely making it, extra needy, and ethnic second city strugglers, categories that are clearly proxies for race and class with exploitative financial products. Unless we closely interrogate the foundations of our ICT paradigm, Development built on ICTs will only end up deepening inequality and injustice. It is indeed possible that with prudence and a people-centric approach, the affordances of big data can be harnessed for development. But the real tipping point where development meets local transformation is in the power of small. The power of community-generated data through which we have seen marginalized women running telecenters renegotiate their power and status. These new institutional thresholds call for rethinking national and global frameworks on internet governance and data ownership and control. Today, massive market distortions not only hamper public benefit delivery through ICTs, but also inhibit new market players. For instance, in the US, 13 out of the 30 largest publicly traded corporations are internet-related companies, and most are monopolies. Their global power is immense. Social reality, economic, cultural, and political, in the next few decades is unequivocally predicated upon techno and data architectures. These two meta-realities will rearrange social power relations. Global public policy action is therefore necessary to ensure sufficient publicness of the internet as a decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, open, and egalitarian infrastructure to promote a commons-based framework of the digital architecture, including open and public standards, net neutrality, and principles governing data ownership to address surveillance and mass social control. The NSA disclosures, as we have seen, signal far-reaching implications for human rights, the right to development, and international cooperation. They also indicate an urgency and indeed a crisis of ethics demanding immediate international public policy action to reclaim the public interest and public goods elements in the digital architecture. Unless the focus of North-South cooperation can shift in this direction, the role of ICTs for development will remain an empty dream. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Guru Murthy for, for your statement.
And now we move on with uh, Ms. Corrine Woods, current director of the United Nations Millennium Campaign. Please, Ms. Woods, you have the floor for your statement. Thank you very much. And thank you for excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to dis be a discussant at this high level event. I would like to focus my comments on the issues of the data revolution for sustainable development and how these, this data needs to be available to people and how we need to be accountable, have that accountability that follows. This issue of accountability and voice and ICTs is something that sits at the heart of the discussion on post-2015 and was noted in the high-level panel's report of eminent persons in May 2013. I'd like to focus my comments on three areas. One, the potential, two, the challenges, and three, a moment of hope. The potential. As Dr. Torre has said, the world has approximately 7 billion people, and there are 6.8 billion mobile phone subscriptions globally. While broadband coverage is lagging, interesting new technologies are a helping to bridge, bridge this gap and being able to bridge with more advanced ones. One example is software that allows data browsing on mobile phones that do not have broadband capability. This technology has allowed broad citizen outreach around the world. Furthermore, platforms like change.org with over 60 million users prove to be amplifying people's voices. Another interesting example has been the missed call campaigns in India, which have gathered 4.5 million responses in a couple of days around issues that people in India care about. That's the potential, and we have seen it in the post-2015 discussions. However, the challenges remain, and we need to be very clear about what those challenges are. Tele technology has allowed us to gather in people's voices and conversations through platforms like My World, like The World We Want, where we have up to three million people who've responded and given their reviews. And undoubtedly, this is a useful input into the conversations and provides one piece of information around considerations of what might the new agenda be. However, there are challenges. First of all, to say, when we look at those responses, over half of them come from pieces of paper, ballots, bits of paper, and people not going through mobile phones or other forms of technology, be that internet. I was just talking to uh, a, de a delegation from Mexico who in the city of Mexico are planning to bring in one million new voices through the My World survey. And their response on how do you hear from young people in Mexico was not through mobile phones, barely through internet, and actually through sitting down in communities and talking directly to people, partly because of the expense. And we need to accept that this is the reality as we are sitting at this moment. We have issues that, o that hinder the potential that we see from technology. Secondly, as my other discussant said, the issue of gender is quite, quite significant. In the My World survey, on mobile phones, we have seen a 75 to 25 percent imbalance in male responses. The issue is, is that through mobile phones, it is men that are responding and men that are dominating. And so the female voice is lost in that. Yes, the issue of big data is also there. We hear much about the potential to scrape, analyze, and understand. And we have seen this again in the post-2015 conversation. With an entity such as Global Pulse, we've been able to look at 10 million tweets a day. But the question remains, who are those tweets coming from? What are they saying? And how are they genuinely contributing? So the potential is there, but we need to think through what that actually means and how it can be useful, but we do not weight too heavily its value. Finally, there is an issue around ICTs of not being extractive. Citizens' voices are not about an extractive data gathering exercise, but genuinely, genuinely around an ongoing conversation of what it takes to develop and bring about um, development. So therefore, we need to be cautious and learn from where the challenges are not around ICTs and what they can help to hear citizen voices, but what is the a level of responsiveness around government? Our issues really are around looking at the total cycle of development rather than seeing ICTs as the silver bullet that will come in and solve things. 
Those are the challenges. Where sits the hope? We sit here, the Charter of the United Nations, based on we the peoples. If we can genuinely bring we the peoples into the formation of the new agenda, we have, we have a powerful new start that we didn't have for the MDGs. If we can similarly bring the we the peoples into the implementation of the new agenda, ICTs have a role to play. But let us be cautious about what they can bring and what they can't bring, what value they bring and what they do not tell us. Let's look at their potential and also estimate the potential in the future. And let's make sure we are making a purposive effort to include them in the post-2015 agenda in a very clear way and in a very thoughtful way, based on our experience. Thank you for taking this time. I thank uh, Karine Woods for her statement, and uh, I now give the floor to Mr. Matthew Bombs, Communications Manager of Communitas, Coalition for Sustainable Cities and Regions in the United Nations Development Agenda. Uh, Mr. Bombs has the floor. Gracias, señor presidente. Excellencies, colleagues, friends, panelists, discussants, it's an honor to be here today. I thought it important to, um, to speak uh, not on behalf of the Communitas Coalition, um, but on behalf of um, teachers, students, and principals that I've worked closely with in Northwest Argentina. Um, I wanted to address specifically the digital divide, um, hoping to um, perhaps uh, ground this discussion today on ICTs uh, in the post-2015 agenda. Um, we should remember that this phenomenon of technology um, as a transformative tool is not a new discussion. Um, that in 1846, proponents of the telegraph thought that they were witnessing, and I quote, the creation of one intellectual neighborhood. And in the 20th century, a global village was prophesized, in which all new forms of electronic media would forge one collective global identity. Now, when we speak of the digital divide, there are certain temporal and spatial assumptions that we're making. Um, uh, that I think in practice have been somewhat problematic um, for schools that they've been trying to help. It's become a decidedly technical approach to many social and political problems um, that we find today in the development world. And I wanted to be clear that the digital divide, what it means for schools, particularly schools in underprivileged regions around the world, the assumption has been that if computers can overcome distance spatially and temporally, then they can surely leapfrog the same valleys which have alienated poor and typically rural schools. To be sure, there's been a lot of research on this matter. To start, it's, it's certain that information literacy is heavily influenced by socioeconomic advantage. This brings up a second digital divide, which I feel is more important. The second divide is faced by low-income children who often lack the conceptual and language abilities necessary for information literacy. A study in 1993, for instance, proved that far more influential than technology itself is the social envelope of educational computing. The social envelope simply represents attitudes and behaviors that govern ICTs for learning. It implies that the process of learning by computer depends not just on family background, but also the character of social expectations and communication around that technology. So where more privileged schools might use computers for problem solving and in-depth learning, Low-income schools tend to favor skill reinforcement and remediation. Teachers who might be unfamiliar or uncomfortable with simulation and presentation software will be reluctant to incorporate sophisticated applications into the curricula. Hence, even the most promising technology could ultimately fail depending on the social envelope surrounding it. One study that I want to bring to attention um, in this event is one by Mark Warshower in 2003. He proves that investments have been imbalanced when it comes to um, resources spent on ICTs for education. He argues that while schools and governments have been generous with physical and digital resources, they often overlook the human resources and social resources that are necessary to make those investments worthwhile and effective. Human resources are basically targeting underlying literacies, digital literacies that ultimately determine if those investments will succeed. And the social resources provide institutional support. Some basic examples include email lists, bulletin boards, ways for teachers to really activate technology for their students. 
I wanted to close very basically with some policy implications that I found in my research with working with teachers and working with principals in rural, rural areas and rural pockets of Argentina. The first one is that we need to factor in more resources than laptops themselves. And I speak of laptops, but of course, traditional PCs are included in this category as well. The second is develop your own educational philosophy and software. A good example of this is Uruguay. In Uruguay, every student in the country has a laptop. Um, it's become quite a symbol of education and quite a symbol of the transformative power of ICTs. If, if every local and national government took the example of, of Uruguay and really appropriated technology developing their own philosophy and software, the role of ICTs would be extremely more effective. The third lesson is to provide for necessary infrastructure. This includes internet as well as repair systems. What are students to do if a computer should fail them? Is the family responsible for the cost of repair if a student is given a laptop? Fourth, governments must collaborate with schools to express a clear social envelope, calibrating norms and expectations between schools and the wider region in which they find themselves. Last but not least, we must improve digital literacy, especially where teachers see laptops as a gateway to information. In closing, I don't want to reject the principle of IT ICTs for education. Certainly, they're a huge step forward in addressing what has become a social bottleneck for lagging regions. However, we now have empirical complexities which we can point to, which determine whether computers in schools will thrive or fail. That's why a comprehensive approach to infrastructural and social planning should be indispensable to the success of laptops in primary schools. At a most basic level, Projects focusing on teacher inclusion and digital literacy will benefit the most from laptop capital in the classroom. Thank you so much. I want to thank Matthew Baum for, for his statement and uh, with his participation, we have listened to all three discussions. So now we'd like to move into a more interactive session uh, with uh, participants from the different uh, countries here your presence. So uh, I would just like to encourage and limit the participation to two minutes. So we'll have the opportunities for, for uh, a couple to uh, really uh, be part of this interactive session. So anyone interested now, uh, we open the floor to a, a more interactive uh, communication with the panelists here. Uh, the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, four comments uh, concerning the, 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 the this thematic session. Um, first of all, my, my delegation would like to, to, to emphasize the need of a credible accountability framework to monitor the compliance of the commitments associated with, with the post-2015 uh, uh, development agenda. Uh, in particular, the means of implementation. The means of implementation are central to, the, to this uh, new development uh, agenda, and we believe that development cooperation uh, needs to incorporate a multidimensional perspective on financing for development, including trade, technology transfer, debt, and capacity building. In this context, uh, traditional modalities of develop development cooperation need to be realigned to the broad set of the sustainable development goals currently under, under const construction. Uh, a second comment relates to South-South cooperation. We believe that South-South cooperation is well placed to support implementation of the post-2015 development agenda due to its, to its uh, flexibility in responding to development challenges. Uh, also, its participatory approach, the absence of conditionalities, and particularly the attention granted to promoting structural and durable changes. Uh, third, in what concerns uh, triangular cooperation, my delegation would like to emphasize that this modality has a giant potential to bridge ODA and South-South cooperation, and thus contribute to a more effective development cooperation. However, to be successful, uh, the partners in triangular cooperation need to recognize themselves as equals and ensure a shared gov governance of the partnership. And as a closing remark, my delegation would like to stress that in what, in what concerns ICT, 
uh, that uh, cyberspace and much of the technologies associated with it need to be kept mostly public, affordable, accessible, and accountable to democratic gov global governance and the rule of law. We need to ensure its use for peace peaceful purposes and to engage it in the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the representative of Brazil and now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Je vous remercie beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, et je remercie également les panélistes pour euh, les différentes informations apportées. Euh, D'entrée de jeu, je, je corrobore euh, à la remarque faite par, euh, par vous, Monsieur le modérateur, qui est que euh, le, dans la coopération, euh, le, vous, vous parliez de, de, voilà, vous disiez tout à l'heure que dans la coopération, euh, en fait, la coopération doit aller de pair, à, euh, de pair avec le domaine technologique. Et cela, le Gabon l'a très bien compris. C'est ainsi que dans les cellules de coordination, euh, en ce qui concerne les, les différents programmes, les différentes exécutions de programmes qui concernent les domaines environnementaux, euh, on exige la formation en technologie de l'information et, et de la communication. C'est très important et nous avons plusieurs projets comme ça où euh, cela est exigé des entreprises. Sans oublier que euh, le, le gouvernement gabonais a un département qui est dédié à l'économie numérique. Euh, nous sommes euh, en ce moment euh, au niveau du multimédia dans l'ère de la, de la euh, télévision numérique Terre. On est passé de l'analogie à haute fréquence à, à la télévision numérique Terre. Nous sommes passés du GPS au 4G, 3G, 4G. Euh, nous avons la fibre optique. Donc, ce sont des efforts-là que le gouvernement gabonais euh, réalise afin que les technologies de l'information et de la communication soient socialisées. Nous avons, euh, dans notre pays, euh, jusque dans les villages, l'utilisation euh, euh, de, de la téléphonie mobile et euh, la, la dissémination de, de cyber euh, euh, un peu partout à, à des prix modiques. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment important. Et même dans l'éducation, nous avons euh, l'usage de, de, des ordinateurs euh, pour euh, des curricula. Et, et donc, c'est juste pour partager cela qui prouve qu'il y a des, des pays africains qui, justement, euh, prennent vraiment en compte la nécessité d'allier le développement aux, aux, aux technologies de l'information et de la communication. Et c'est à cela que, effectivement, nous, Gabon, nous appuierons le fait que ça soit un, une cible prioritaire pour la mise en œuvre des différents programmes. Merci. I want to thank the representative of Gabon for sharing with us uh, this very important information about uh, how in uh, her country uh, there is a very precise uh, agenda on, on digital development. So now uh, we give the floor to the representative of Austria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to address uh, this important uh, topic Mr. Touré spoke very passionately about the enabling function of ICT for the post-2015 development agenda. And this, of course, obliges us also to look at what is enabled by ICT. Yesterday, Austria uh, spoke about humanitarian telemedicine as one of the applications one should look at uh, because uh, humanitarian telemedicine can enable also the health agenda. Uh, which uh, is important for the post-2015 uh, development agenda. And I shall not repeat uh, what I said about uh, humanitarian telemedicine yesterday, only remind you that what we understand this to be is to use telemedicine as a bridge connecting well-served uh, 
communities well served by medical uh, expertise uh, with regions which are in desperate need of medical expertise. So humanitarian telemedicine allows a doctor uh, in a well served uh, area uh, to provide uh, primary uh, care uh, in an underserved uh, area. So if we look at this then from the perspective of north-south, south-north, uh, south-south, uh, uh, triangular and so on, we might see uh, that the cooperation uh, uh, definitions become a little bit fluid. Yesterday, Japan and I think the UK said the distinction between north and south is not so clear. Uh, and this is true, but the cooperation forms uh, are also interesting uh, to observe. And I would like to uh, reflect on this by uh, using this example of humanitarian telemedicine. So assume now that you have a hub uh, in Vienna in Austria, uh, where a civil servant, Austrian doctor, is providing primary diagnosis uh, in a rural area in the south. Then you would, from a categorization perspective, presumably say this is North-South uh, cooperation. But let's then change the example a little bit and say, ah, but this is a volunteer doctor, an Austrian volunteer doctor who is providing a first diagnosis in a rural area in the South. You would presumably still say that it is North-South, but it's not quite the same because this is person to person, human to human which is a very nice uh, feature, not to replace governmental uh, uh, cooperation uh, north-south, but it is very nice when one can engage the civil society in this fashion. And then the final uh, configuration I would like to draw your attention to is that if you then have this hub in Vienna, but uh, the doctor is not a Viennese doctor, but an expatriate from the country in the south, where he is providing uh, diagnostic uh, uh, assistance uh, via the telemedicine link. Is it then uh, north-south? Is it south-south? Or is it really domestic, uh, domestic uh, diagnosis and uh, cooperation he is embodying? So I think that it, uh, we should remember that this linking function can link in many different fashions, including to expatriate uh, populations, which might be very willing to help if they can do that also uh, from a distance. And this is true not only for the health agenda, but I think it is possibly uh, relevant also for education agenda, uh, for many uh, parts of uh, the civil society agenda. So ultimately what we are saying is, we need to look at this in a very <clears throat> differentiated fashion and that uh, uh, we should not let ourselves be blinded by north-south, south-south, triangular. Uh, there are many permutations on this theme and when we are going forward on the post-2015 agenda, we should harvest all that we can from this, including the possibilities of letting ICT connect uh, civil uh, society uh, to the agenda. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank also the representative of Austria for his very insightful and interesting comments. And now uh, we have a representative from civil society here, Mr. Hamilton, Stuart Hamilton, uh, who will be speaking on behalf of the International Federation of Library Associations. Mr. Stuart Hamilton, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for giving the floor to IFLA, uh, the global voice of libraries and their users. I was lucky enough to be able to make an intervention this morning on the digital divide, so this afternoon I would like to concentrate on knowledge sharing. Yesterday we heard from the President of the General Assembly that cross-border collaboration is a positive result of access to ICTs. We also heard many delegates mention how important it is to share information across borders and how key knowledge sharing will be in the post-2015 environment. IFLA could not agree more. I think all of us here are excited by the possibilities of the digital, but I have to tell you something worrying. The international copyright framework that libraries need to share information is not fit for the digital age. We rely on exceptions to copyright to open up information resources for our users and to help those in the developing world 
have access to the same information opportunities as those in the developed. The shift from print materials to digital materials has seen publishers lock up information behind paywalls and extremely restricted licenses. And copyright exceptions and limitations that enabled us to do our job in the print age no longer work for most countries in the 21st century. Even in many developed countries, where good exceptions exist, they are often overridden by private contract. The result of all this, well, the world that we're talking about here in the discussions in the Sustainable Development Goals and the post-2015, where there's information shared across borders for the benefit of development, this world will not come about. You might be able to access information you want, but only if you can afford it. Copyright is not fit for purpose in the age of the data revolution, and for our data revolution to work, we need an international copyright framework that enables libraries to support this sort of collaboration. Now, IFLA, my organization, is working at the World Intellectual Property Organization for an international legal framework for libraries and archives that will enable the information sharing across borders that we want, which will lead to greater opportunities for access to research and culture, particularly in developing countries. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to visit ifla.org to find out more. In this context, we're encouraged to hear Anita Guru Murphy, Silva, Silvia Ribeiro yesterday, and some distinguished delegates call for a rethinking of the legal frameworks that govern the internet. We must include copyright in the development equation. If we are serious about harnessing the power of the data revolution, then we have to be serious about supporting it. And that means we will have to update copyright to focus it on benefiting users, not rent seekers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, uh, Stuart, for your very uh, interesting comments about copyrights and uh, information sharing. And now we'll go to a second round with our panelists. We will have the opportunity to answer to some of the questions, some of the observations and comments made by our discussants. So uh, we're free to begin with any one of you interested in uh, responding to some of the questions being raised here. So we begin uh, with Dr. Stephen. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for those very interesting uh, interventions. Um, let me make a point about ICT for, for development. I think we need to draw a distinction between consumer technologies um, and the many structural technologies that we will need if we're to deliver the post-2015 goals and targets effectively. So I think it's very important to talk about laptops uh, for children but it's also important to talk about the technologies that we need to make schools and school systems operate effectively. Uh, and I think if we just look at the consumer side, then we're really looking at just the tip of the, tip of the iceberg. Let me give an example, if I, if I may. I mean, a testing and ex or examination system within a school system, that's a technology. It's a technology with three functions. It tells students, parents, and teachers where the children are learning. It motivates that learning, because you can see who's failing and who's succeeding, both at student and at school level. And it provides accountability for the school system as a whole. Now, you can run a technology like that on paper, and many uh, countries have, have done throughout, throughout history. But modern ICT can make that, um, ex that testing system easier to implement and more effective and more transparent. And it provides especially important um, potential for countries um, where children have no access to proper testing within um, schools and they don't have access to a proper record of their educational career. For me, that's the true deep digital divide. Um, children who are going to school systems that function effectively and can provide them with what they need, or children who are going to school systems that don't, and we can use technology to bridge that gap. I think we can make the same argument about poverty. Social transfers are only possible. Social transfers are only possible with the targeting and payment systems that technology allows, um, that allow really very precise targeting of who needs the social protection payment, uh, and allows that very qu actually quite small sums of money to be transferred cost effectively. Again, a structural technology that transforms people's lives and has made a tremendous difference. Same we could say about energy, we could say the same about food, we could say it's the same about, about health. So I would beg you in this, uh, in this debate to think not just about what consumers are doing, but how we build the plumbing of societies using technology in a way that will deliver the change that we are seeking. 
Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Now I turn the floor over to Dr. Ture for final comments. Yeah. Thank you. I, I want to pick up on a uh, comment made by the Honorable Delegate from Austria uh, about telemedicine. I think it's a very important element. We do have an initiative with WHO currently going on called Be Healthy, Be Mobile, using the power of mobile uh, communications for uh, mobile telephony uh, to help for telemedicine. Uh, we are running some programs in some key countries, uh, Costa Rica, for helping for cessation of smoking, in Senegal for uh, addressing issues of diabetes, and uh, in Zambia for issues of uh, 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 cervical cancer. All of those are non-communicable diseases that have created more uh, 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 actually death today uh, than any other uh, disease. So, we're addressing those. But what is important in all of these countries is that uh, the partnership model that we're doing, it's uh, the public-private partnership, including governments, uh, insurance companies, telecommunication operators, pharmaceutical companies, and development banks. Those are uh, some examples that show that, indeed, we can do something about these things. Uh, and I agree with comments made uh, by some people saying it needs to be conceived locally. We are not for assisting countries. We want to accompany them in what they want, they believe in. Uh, any country needs to uh, develop its own development strategy. If any development strategy made from, we, I'm based in Geneva, I'm saying to countries, I don't believe in any development strategy for you developed from, from Geneva or from Paris or, 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 or New York or Washington. If you don't dis conceive it yourself, you're in deep trouble. And I believe that in developing countries, they can be poor, but they still do have people who can think. And we're dealing with uh, uh, a technology that is based on brain power, that is the only natural resource that is equally distributed in the world. No nation, race, or culture has more or, more or less of that. And we can work with them. When they develop it, they believe in it, we work with them. Uh, development partners will come. Uh, we believe in AIDS, but not too much AIDS. <coughs> we believe in that partners should put at least one penny from their own pocket. Otherwise, the development 100% will not be efficient. It, 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 they will not give any value to it. All of those are things that we, we know at their work, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel, and that we are moving forward. We are trying to go fast and try to uh, scale up. Uh, scaling up is it will be key. Uh, to make sure that we have key success stories. I don't believe in pilot projects. Pilots are meant to fly, and, and there are many successful stories that are already we can replicate elsewhere. So we move it forward quickly, and it works. So uh, that's my comment in here. Thank you, Dr. Turi. Now we turn the floor over to uh, Her Excellency Suvi Linden for final comments. Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, couple of remarks on, on, on quite, quite a very good discussion there has been here. First of all, uh, the digital revolution has happened so fast that there are a lot of examples of the, the regulation and international ruling that doesn't fit into digital world. And uh, as here it was mentioned that copyright issues is, is one, one of these issues. Um, I have an experience of that field since I was also Minister of Culture that time when the, the digital copyright agreement was, was made by WIPO and, and it was very complicated and hard and, and it's very important that we start to, and it has been, of course, the discussion has already started, but we should have these things on, on, on the table even though it's very painful since there is a copyright owners on the other side of the table and other side of the table, those who would like to use all the, the information which is available there. And the issue is, of, of course, how do we find the model that those who, who have the rights for the, for the information, that how do they benefit for that in the digital world? It's very complicated and challenging, but, but I think that we should tackle about it otherwise since the content is the king, this is a very, very uh, typical phrase we are using that 
that we can make it true and available for everyone, we have to find a way to, to, to do these copyright issues. The other one is about the, the, the putting, uh, invest also on human capacity, not only the, the technology. I think that many countries, Finland along, did the, the, the mistakes a couple decades ago when we started to develop the first phase of the information society and we were buying computers and, and, and putting a lot of money on technology. But that time we forgot and we didn't realize how important it is that, that we keep up and, and invest also the human capital on, on this field. And, and I think that developing countries can learn a lot from those mistakes because I think it's the easy way to do it, to put just money on the technology and computers while we should start the, the starting to re-educate teachers. And we will have the digital divide in, in, in our teaching capacity for decades still. We have a lot of teachers, even in developed countries, who don't have experience of using computers in education. And if the computers are given to them, they don't know how to, to utilize them. Quite often, the, the students know that better than the teacher. So I think that the, the, we should start on, on, on education for the teachers, how to use. And then, of course, devices and tools are important, but those are not the most important thing if you want to, to get the, the best results of, of the of, of this process, but I still think that it's a great opportunity to to reach out. Even in Finland, we are a big country. Uh, we have a sparsely populated areas, and 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 we can reach the students there through in, uh, telecommunication infrastructure and, and internet, and provide a possibility to learn languages and have the same courses as, as the kids in the big cities where there are different kind of possibilities. So the, the, I, I still think that the, it's, it's a great tool and an and opportunity for education for all, but of course you have to have a wise plan how to, to implement it for, 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 uh, for, for its use. Well, thank you. And, uh your participation, Suvi. I think we have heard the last speaker of the panelists for this second panel discussion for today. But before concluding, I would like to uh, commend all panelists and participants for the very dynamic, uh, intelligent, and insightful participations. In listening to uh, David Stephen a little while ago, while you were making some sort of timeline, how many days are left for the MDGs? and how many days we have uh, for the implementation of the post-2050 development agenda. Well, uh, it's important because it gives us some sense of timing. Uh, there is a time constraint in achieving the MDGs and also moving forward to a new stage of the post-2015 uh, development agenda. But what I think is, is important for all of us to kind of think about is that we are going through a transition from a from an industrial period, from an industrial era, into an information society. And uh, I do think that what the MDGs was all about was about the weaknesses and flaws, the things that were not achieved by uh, emerging economies within the industrial society. And now we have to move into a new economic and social paradigm, which is the information society, and we have to drag some of our weaknesses from the previous industrial era. And, and then we need to make this combination overcoming our weaknesses and confronting the new challenges of the information society. And this will have to do essentially with the use of technologies, information and communication technologies that has to be put in the forefront of the post-2015 development agenda as Dr. Ture has indicated. It was somehow misplaced, it was uh, understated within the MDGs. It now has to be given uh, a more active role in the post-2015 agenda because it can enable countries to really move forward at a faster and a faster pace. Uh, we can accelerate, we can leapfrog into the future by using these uh, new information and communications technologies. Of course, some countries cannot do it by themselves, so there is a need to continue uh, having some sort of cooperation. And this is why we look at it in, in three different uh, uh, ways of being, from north-south, 
from south-south and from a triangular perspective. Now, all these have to be combined uh, in order to have some sense of solidarity, sharing, and uh, enabling uh, emerging economies to be part of the modern world. So I think uh, we have come up with uh, some clear ideas in order to move forward with our post-2015 uh, development agenda. But before I conclude, I hear that the representative of Gabon would also like uh, to intervene once again. So you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. C'est je viens tout juste rassurer Monsieur David Steven, qui faisait remarquer qu'il fallait pas que les technologies de l'information et de la communication soient juste euh, euh, arrêtées au sens de de, de consommation, de, de 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 commercialisation. Euh, je voudrais qu'ils s'en rassurent parce que nous au Gabon. Bien que nous soyons des consommateurs, parce qu'il y a des commerces pour cela, nous utilisons les technologies de l'information et de la communication pour un réel développement. Euh, nous a, je vais donc corroborer à ce que vient de dire M. Amadoun Touré concernant euh, le, la technologie de l'information et de la communication dans la santé. Nous l'utilisons justement pour faire la sensibilisation des maladies transmissibles, non, des maladies euh, non transmissibles. Au Gabon, nous avons déjà cette expérience. Au Gabon, nous avons l'expérience de l'inscription en ligne dans les universités et les grandes écoles. Nous le faisons déjà. Au Gabon, nous avons l'utilisation des services financiers par la téléphonie mobile parce que nous sommes un des pays en Afrique centrale où nous avons euh, sur le marché des grandes industries, des, des grandes entreprises en matière de téléphonie et qui nous offrent ces services-là et nous les utilisons. Ça apporte un réel changement dans la vie euh, quotidienne de, de certaines, des personnes déjà qui, qui s'intéressent à la technologie de l'information et de la communication. Cela nous amène à dire que le, 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 le sujet nous, nous amène à penser à la culture. C'est une question hautement culturelle. Ce que le gouvernement gabonais s'attelle à faire, c'est de veiller à ce que ça devienne une culture, d'utiliser l'ordinateur, l'outil de l'ordinateur, de, de, de savoir euh, s'en servir. Et euh, c'est à cela que euh, je suis très, euh, très ravie d'entendre ce que Mme Souvi Linden vient de dire en disant que... Euh, nous ne devons pas penser qu'à donner les ordinateurs, il faut former, et c'est vrai, il faut former les, les professeurs, et, parce qu'en effet, l'étudiant utilise mieux l'ordinateur que son professeur. Euh, et c'est très important, euh, en, en sortant de cet échange, je pense que c'est un point important qu'il va falloir toujours euh, rappeler euh, à nos gouvernants. Je vous remercie. Or maybe Dr. Steven would like to react to the uh, comments. Well, just to, to entirely endorse them, I mean, it sounds as in being Gabon, technology is being used as an accelerant across all sorts of um, processes, and that's exactly what I would advocate when we look at the post-2015 agenda. I mean, to come back to my original points, we have the potential, we're potentially going to set an enormous number of incredibly challenging goals and targets. Um, these cannot be met without more effective use of technology. Technology can allow us to do in 50 years, in 15 years, what would otherwise take 50, um, 50 years to, to achieve. So this systematic approach that Gabon is taking of looking at different sectors and how technology can be used, I think is incredibly important. And, and if I may, Mr. Chow, I'll just come back to Ms. Gura Murthy's um, point about, uh, about risk and about um, um, security. I, I do think this is something that we need to be more serious about. You know, in social protection systems, we now have biometric systems that allow us to track people very effectively and send money to them. But these systems are also open for abuse, and we need to make sure that we have the regulatory environment that will enable us to use them for good and not for them to be stilted for ill. So I'd like to thank her for her comments on that. Uh, Dr. Ture. Oui, je voudrais juste euh, ajouter au commentaire mais, euh, fait par le, le délégué du, du Gabon. Le Gabon est un de ces pays africains qui a effectivement euh, une vision 2020 qui est basée sur trois, trois piliers. 
dans euh, le Gabon numérique. Hein. Il y a le Gabon vert, le Gabon numérique et le Gabon minier. Et donc ces trois axes principaux sont là. Et l'avantage, c'est que ça a été conçu de l'intérieur. Et c'est pourquoi j'insiste sur le fait qu'il est important que tous les programmes de développement soient conçus au niveau des pays. Et ça, le Gabon a été un bon exemple. Donc je voudrais juste appuyer ce qu'elle vient de dire. Merci. Well, I think we have arrived now to the conclusion of this uh, second panel discussion on the post-2015 agenda uh, and the related to uh, North-South, South-South and Triangular Cooperation, as well as the implementation of the ICT uh, for, for sustain, sustainable development. Uh, there will be a final plenary session here in a couple of minutes, so I would suggest that uh, we suspend our meeting now and come back a little bit later in order to participate in the final ceremony. But I, I felt that this room has been very quiet the last few days, and I want to recognize our panelists uh, with having a, a round of applause for all of them for the work that they have done. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thank you, um, thank you very much for um, your patience. Um, let us begin. Let us resume. I would like to express my appreciation to all participants in the high-level event of the General Assembly on the contribution of North-South, South-South Triangular Cooperation and Information and Communication Technology for Development to the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. We have had two panel discussions, and I would now like to take the liberty of um, um, handing over the chair, I have handing over the floor to hear summaries of the two panel discussions by our respective chairs. So let me now give the floor to Ms. Jane Stewart, Special Representative and Director of the Office of International Labor Organization to the United Nations, who chaired panel one discussion this morning. So I, I now give you the floor, madam. Thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates. I had the great pleasure to moderate a very um, engaged panel this morning. Uh, it was a fulsome debate and discussion with member states and civil society. And the question that we were asked, as you know, many of you participated, was how can all types of cooperation be strengthened to promote economic growth, employment, and decent work for all? At the outset, I would say that there was a general agreement that the post-2015 development framework needed to tackle the unfinished business of the MDGs. It was clearly recognized that economic growth does not automatically lead to the creation of decent jobs nor then to poverty reduction, and new forms of cooperation can and must address this in order to achieve a truly sustainable development. It was also recognized that inequality can be and is a major problem and obstacle to development, and the pursuit of greater equality can be considered potentially as a contributor to growth. Um, in terms of moving from sort of some broad understandings that I have just described, we then looked at cooperation itself as a means for implementing sustainable development, in particular to promote economic growth, employment, and decent work for all. And it was suggested that the new agenda provides a real opportunity to rethink the definition and role of North-South, South-South, South-North and triangular cooperation to address the level of asymmetry in terms of capacity, technology transfers, intellectual regulatory frameworks, and financial flows region to region. It was also noted that practically, cooperation must support country ownership through the building of adequate human and institutional capacities. <coughs> and that it requires a much fuller, more inclusive, and substantive engagement with all stakeholders, including the private sector and civil society. 
And this was marked by a number of specific examples, not least of which, which was an interesting discussion on extractive industries particularly, where there was an appreciation that cooperation needs to engage the multinationals, to bring them together with all the stakeholders, including governments, not least of course, to identify the proper strategies to maximize the return to the country from those that are making the extractions. So we also had this wonderful opportunity to hear specific examples of uh, cooperation that identified and highlighted some of these major points that I'm making. It was determined that knowledge sharing and mutual learning is critical to tackle development challenges beyond the post-2015 uh, agenda and that all forms of cooperation can assist with this. The post-2015 era requires strengthened development cooperation based on shared responsibility, accountability and transparency, as well as targeted on measurable results. There was a good discussion and a common appreciation of the importance of the need for transparency for sustainable decisions to be made. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a list of 19 key points that were identified by the Office of the PGA that will additionally inform the conclusions here. But um, what I would like to say in continuation are that it was appreciated that ODA has a critical role and should continue flowing. However, it's imperative to encourage foreign direct investment, that we tackle illicit financial flows and reduce the cost of remittances, and that cooperation has to start to look at these means of implementation themselves and, and that it's through a cooperation uh, south, 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 north and uh, um, uh, triangular cooperation that these solutions, solutions to these uh, um, means of uh, implementation can be addressed. The idea of international cooperation was highlighted and that in fact there is and must be a global response to these priority areas if we are indeed going to have the financing available to deliver on an expansive 2015 agenda that you can see just from this panel that identified priority areas of, uh, of focus to be, uh, um, to be uh, financed. So I'll leave it at that. Thank member states for their uh, generous contributions during the morning panel and say what a pleasure it was to be part of this. Let me on your behalf thank the uh, special representative and director of the of ILO for um, summary of the discussion and uh, we once again uh, applaud you for, um, for, um, for managing the rich discussion that transpired um, I will now turn to um, the second panel, and I, I now give the floor to His Excellency uh, Lionel Fernandez, former President of Dominican Republic, Excellency, uh, who will um, now give a summary of uh, panel two. Excellency, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, distinguished panelists, Excellencies, uh, representatives of governments and of uh, civil society. In the uh, second panel discussion, I should say, was a very dynamic, enthusiastic, with uh, many insightful comments. And we tackled the issue on the contributions of North-South, South-South Triangular Corporation, and ICT for development to the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. So there was some sort of a coincidence, but at the same time, some differences from the first panel in the morning. And I, uh, I think... Uh, all the discussion really focused on three main issues. One had to do with the role of ICT, the other on data revolution, digital media, and copyright, and a third more focused specifically on cooperation, the three areas of North-South, South-South, and triangular cooperation. Uh, related to the uh, role of ICT in the post-2015 agenda, uh, the main idea was that ICT is an essential feature of modern life to getting and creating jobs, to providing good governance, providing public services, that they're essential to social inclusion, health, education, women's empowerment, and eradicating poverty. Uh, it was also considered that ICT promotion needs to play a larger role in the post-2015 agenda than it did in the MDG era. The whole idea is that the uh, MDGs were considered to overcome some of the flaws 
from uh, an economic model that derives from the industrial uh, society. Uh, moving into the post-2015 uh, development agenda is more making a shift into the information society. So in that case, it is important to highlight the role that ICT can play in fulfilling uh, the uh, post-2015 development agenda. The private sector needs an, an, an enabling environment to invest in the expansion of telecommunication infrastructure. Uh, there needs to be capacity building and training uh, that are considered crucial for the expansion of broadband networks, uh, including fostering an understanding of information security. Uh, closing the digital divide will require not only investment in technology, but investments in human and social resources. So a special emphasis was placed on quality education. Moving into the data revolution, uh, digital media and copyright, uh, some basic ideas were, were presented to the panel. Uh, one is that there is a striking absence of policy and legal framework to protect civil rights online and regulate the use of data ownership and control. There were some very critical comments on, on big data, the use of big data and analytics and the way that they tend to control uh, uh, privacy of individuals and, and citizens. Uh, the use of big data for development needs to consider the real-time data underrepresents marginalized groups and women. Uh, there is tremendous potential for using ICT for sustainable development, as could be seen uh, with my world survey, for example. I was given as, as a very specific example. However, in many countries, online surveys are not cost-effective, and there needs to be uh, voices heard of those who do not have access to ICT. Uh, it was considered that there is a gender imbalance in responses to online surveys, uh, with 75% of responses coming from men. So there is, uh, I would say, a marginalization of women in these types of surveys. Knowledge sharing is key to the post-2015 agenda, and the international copyright framework is not fit to this challenge. So there, there was a consideration of how to uh, rethink the copyright framework to enable it for the uh, digital media access uh, into the looking into the implementation of the 2015 development agenda. Specifically now on the uh, cooperation side, north, south, 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 and triangular, it was also uh, uh, presented to the panel the idea that the post-2015 agenda will need to be much more ambitious than the MDG uh, framework. Development concepts need to be conceived internally in the host country in order to be effective. Uh, it was emphasized that ending extreme poverty can only be accomplished through effective cooperation and targeted action. Uh, there's no way that in isolation, with no international cooperation, a country can really overcome extreme poverty. This was something that was emphasized, that was underlined, uh, and reinforces the idea of cooperation internationally, international cooperation. Quality of education needs to be improved rather than only providing access to education. Uh, from the uh, Dakar Declaration, no? uh, education to all, major improvements have been made in terms of access to education. In Africa, Latin America, everywhere, uh, access is already over 95, 96% in, in the worst cases. So access is not any, any longer the problem. The problem nowadays has to do with the quality of education. And this will require teacher training programs. It will require new curricula, uh, a new design of curricula that must be taken uh, 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 in, in perspective. And I would say focusing on 21st century skills that has to do with uh, digital literacy, uh, critical thinking, uh, it will have to do with uh, language skills, and of course with math and science. So all this is also part of the uh, new education for the 21st century, developing skills for global citizens. Uh, other areas that were presented to the panel were establishing sustainable energy systems, uh, which require transformational change and additional investments for this sustainable energy system to be implemented. Uh, an effective accountability framework is necessary to track progress towards the sustainable development goals, which is the, the post-15 post development agenda. 
Uh, in summary, the technology goes hand in hand with development and requires cooperating with private partners in order to improve ICT access. Once again, going back to the concept of private public partnerships in order to enable this. Technology uh, is a major component of economic and social development within the 2015 uh, development, post-2015 development agenda. So these were the basic uh, issues that were debated in the second panel discussion. And as I said, I think uh, uh, interesting contributions for uh, finally drafting uh, the whole idea of a 2015 uh, development agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, let me, on behalf of the um, um, membership, uh, thank you, um, um, Chair of Panel 2, um, former President of the uh, Dominican Republic, not only for your comprehensive uh, summary, but also for um, 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 your contribution in managing today's uh, uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our President of the General Assembly has not been able to be with us in person, but he has been following a discussion from, from, uh, from a distance, and uh, um, he has left words, and I will be his voice today in conveying, the, uh, conveying his message, uh, concluding message. So let me begin, and, uh, and I quote, Excellencies, distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to an end of our high-level event, it is appropriate that we look both back and forward, both back and forward, back at some of the key points raised over the last two days and forward at our next steps. Foremost, I would like to thank our chairs, speakers, panelists, and discussants for their engaged participation. They clearly have laid out how harnessing all types of cooperation can enhance and improve post-2015 development agenda, as well as where improvements are needed. And they have put forth important suggestions on how to maximize the benefits of ICTs. As we have just heard from our chairs regarding the highlights from today's panel discussions, allow me to focus my remarks on some key points from yesterday's general debate. Our, participation, our participants discussed development cooperation in its many forms. We have heard about traditional benefits of North-South cooperation, including official development assistance, ODA, capacity building and technology transfer, and how it will have a primary role in the new development agenda. While many participants remind us that existing commitments must be honored, we have heard concerns for the needs of, the, of countries that have recently graduated from the least developed country category, but still need ODA. We were also reminded of the unique perspective of countries that now have now both donors and recipients. Participants hurdled the many gains of South-South cooperation with reference to its benefit to early economic and technological cooperation, democratic systems, environment, social systems, and energy response. We have heard suggestions to strengthen the UN's ability to support South-South cooperation, including the UN Office on South-South Cooperation, the need to develop country-led system to monitor and evaluate South-South cooperation at national level was stressed. However, we have also heard that South-South cooperation should remain voluntary. The benefits of triangular cooperation were also emphasized as a way of, to solve development challenges. While helping developing countries accumulate their own experience and build their capacity as development partners. <coughs> We heard about the widely var var varied and many possible uses of ICTs, including creating new and decent forms of employment, improving financial and social inclusion, infrastructure, new sources of data, transportation system, facilitating banking, education, healthcare, and disaster <coughs> risk reduction. Engaging democratic processes as well as enhancing gender equality. 
it was noted that ICTs can have, and sig can have a significant, significant role as an enabler in all of the focal areas identified by the open working group on discussions on SDGs and can help countries leapfrog and level out the playing field in their development efforts. On one hand, we have heard the ICTs can improve empowerment and inclusion of marginalized groups. Yet on the other hand, it was mentioned that they often control by corporate elites. We have also heard that global intelli intellectual property rights often favor the rich and prohibit the poor from accessing the end product. To this end, there was a suggestion for a collision amongst governments and private sector to ensure ICT connectivity is available internationally. The importance of regulatory framework to protect data and privacy was stressed, as was the need to ensure ICTs do not limit access to information and undermine democracy. Engagement with the private sector was raised as an important consideration, where we heard both endorsement and concerns. Participants recognized that private sector can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of development efforts, but cannot replace governments in the role of service provision. We have heard about the importance of enhancing the private sector role in implementation of the SDGs where they are established. In addition, there were calls for opening trade markets as a tool for development, reforming UN funds and agencies so that they are better prepared to help deliver on the post-2015 development agenda, ensuring a strong accountability framework for the agenda, and possibly taking some initiatives such as the, te such as the technology transfer mechanism out of the confines of a traditional UN structure. Ladies and gentlemen, the inputs from this event will be put in a summary form by my staff with the support from the UN Secretariat and will be distributed in the coming weeks. Our findings here will be part of a large stock taking events to be held early September, which will serve as an input to the Second General Synthesis Report Therefore, we can expect that our work here will be put to good use and positively influence ongoing discussion on the post-2015 development agenda. The President thanks you for sharing your thoughts, raising your concerns, and being part of a process with potentially far-reaching and long-term impact. Thank you very much. Let me now, um, let me now, um, the high level event and of the General Assembly on contribution on North South, South South Triangular Cooperation and Information and Tech Communication Technology for Development to the implementation of the post 2015 development agenda is now concluded. I had to say all of this. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> there you go.